Hey everybody, it's Tabitha Bird Weaver here. I wanted to let you know today on CPTSD podcast, we're going to be talking with Terry Baranski about internal family systems, one of my favorite therapeutic approaches, hands down. And we're really going to delve into what are parts? What does it mean that you have different parts to you? And what do those parts do? How do they help you? How do they create havoc? Um, and what are next steps? So please join us inside. If you would like to get some more information on soul retrievals, which we're going to be talking about in the Karmic Alchemy community, please head on over to tapthebirdweaver.com and subscribe to the Karmic Alchemy community, and you can get access in there to see what we've been talking about already. Also, we have a wonderful announcement that we have created the CPTSD toolkit. It is then live and ready to go. So if you are somebody who is wondering what therapy to start, or I think I have CPTSD, what are next steps? The CPTSD toolkit um, goes into the most helpful types of therapy for CPTSD, what it is, what the therapies do, what their approach is, any comments or concerns that people have about them, and next steps you can take on your own before or while you're waiting for therapy. So check that out. Also available at tabithafordweaver.com. I hope it is helpful to you. We still do have our free resource available on how to find a therapist. So you can also download that there. See you inside. Welcome to the CPTSD podcast, everybody. Here we are in season four, and uh, we're moving along with some really interesting topics and topics and guests. Thank you for all of the questions and comments that you've submitted to us. We really appreciate that. Um, as always, please go ahead and um, like, follow, or share so that we can get this really important information out further. So one of the things I've talked about a lot uh, on this podcast is the idea or the concept of parts. And there are a lot of different ways to talk about parts, and we're going to explore some of that in the next couple of podcasts we do. Um, but also, I've been a big proponent of internal family systems therapy. And I'll tell you what, when somebody comes to me and says, should I do IFS for therapy? Would that work for my complex trauma? I always say yes because I have absolute confidence that IFS is one of the gentlest, most effective ways to get in and return us to wholeness. So today I'm really happy to introduce a guest we have, Terry Bransky. He is an IFS aficionado, um, has written for um, a lot of different magazines, including the CPTSD Foundation, and um, Harry, I'm really excited to talk more about IFS and why you love that so much. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself, including how people can get a hold of you if they'd like to? Um, and then why are you an IFS practitioner? What do you enjoy most about it? Yeah, thank you so much, Tabitha. It's great to be here. Uh, so, so yeah, my name is Terry Baranski. Uh, I, my website is healingtheself.net, uh, all one word. And uh, yeah, so I'm an IFS practitioner. I started seeing and seeing clients three years ago. Uh, this was a career change for me. So I had done IT for the longest time and it was great. And until it wasn't, you know, the passion started to wear off uh, and I, I never knew what else I would do. I had no concept really of changing careers. I, I just was resigned to sticking with it. Uh, and then I just kind of fell into trauma and developmental psychology. I just ran into a video randomly once uh, online from one of my heroes, Gabor Mate. Uh, and it just, I was hooked instantly. It explained so much about me, so much about the world. Uh, and I just couldn't, I started watching and reading everything I could get a hold of uh, mm -hmm. on that. And then I discovered IFS pretty quickly thereafter. And it just immediately resonated. Uh, with how it views the mind and you know we'll talk about that in a minute but and so i became an ifs client you know i, I sucked uh seeked out my own therapist and just saw the results so quickly and, and how powerful it was uh and then it at some point after that it occurred to me oh this is a calling for a career change mm -hmm. oh interesting you know never saw that coming uh the universe had a plan uh i guess which which was was and is exciting to just kind of let that happen uh but yeah so ifs the way it 
sees the mind, which is, is so unique compared to especially in the West, how we usually look at the mind being a single thing, like there's a unitary I and a unitary me. Uh, but in IFS, we talk about multiplicity, right? Mm -hmm. So the mind is made of parts and th that's a good thing. You know, we're, IFS sees, that, sees it as we're born uh, with those parts. They are not created by trauma, as some other uh, approaches say, but just the the uniqueness of that. And then the when we look at what the roles are of the parts in the system and the, the ways they try to protect us, uh, which we'll talk more about, it, it immediately kind of turns on the self-compassion mm. for a lot of people. You know, things that we tend to pathologize and diagnose, so to speak. Now we have, we can look at, kind of turn that around and say, oh, there's a reason why these things happen. It's not random. It's not genetic. The, the, there are parts that are in these roles because they think that's what's in the best interest of the system. So it immediately gets rid of our tendency to pathologize, especially in psychiatry, uh, and really just does a 180 in terms of how we look at uh, symptoms and behavioral patterns, which I, I just think is beautiful. I just want to chime in and say I resonate a lot with the way you're describing your experience of learning about IFS and then what you've learned and how it can uh, benefit us with that different perspective. When I, um, I attended a training with Frank Anderson, and I felt during that training like I had found a piece of my family, <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. finally, other a group of people that are starting to talk about the mind as having multiplicity. And so um, that is very exciting. Um, in my experience, I've worked with parts in a lot of different ways with people, and some of them are very much in the, the system of how trauma creates parts. Um, I just did a soul retrieval with a client yesterday, and I'll talk more about that on a different podcast. But the idea of soul retrieval is that trauma actually, or the injury actually does separate a part of the soul or the self, depending on how you're looking at that. Um, and then that part actually stays there and is stuck and lost. And then we have Ericksonian hypnosis, which is more like inner child type of healing and awarenesses. And the one thing I do like about IFS, just like you're saying, is that IFS considers us to be born in parts and to have that already as a capacity. I would love to hear more about how that differentiation that we've been talking about matters, especially in treatment. And yeah. I just want to say the self-compassion piece, sorry, I inter interrupted my own question there, <laughs> but the self-compassion piece that you're talking about is so crucial and being able to understand parts and that it's natural really does lend kind of a, a quicker extinguishing of some of the inner critic issues or the self-criticism. So please, my question to you again, <laughs> is like it, we were born with capacity or, or just with parts. Talk about a little bit how that helps us compared to the other viewpoint. Sure. Yeah. I, I and I find this fascinating too. You know, the the, the it, when we look at it we're, as the parts are normal and we're born with them, uh, it, it changes so much because there there still can be a tendency to pathologize if we say parts are created by trauma, because the the undertone of that is almost well, then we need to get rid of them, mm. or we need to reintegrate somehow, which is another way of saying get rid of them, mm -hmm. right? So so again, the self-compassion is really helped by, and, and that's not why in IFS we say it, we say it because that, that that's what Dick Schwartz and all the IFS heroes found as this was naturally and organically evolving uh, over time, that, that they're all in there. And ev even when their their pain is unloaded, which, which in IFS we call an unburdening, when the trauma is released, they're still there. But what happens is they they get, for lack of a better way of saying it, they get more integrated, mm. right? So they don't get, it's a spectrum. So they don't get all the way integrated to where they're gone, but they, they, they get integrated to the extent that because they're not, they don't have these uh, behaviors and emotional patterns anymore that are uh, resultant from trauma, you almost don't notice them as much. So you, we'll, you still have the, we, we have our playful parts and our serious parts and our work parts there, but when they're not burdened by all this trauma, the, 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 it's more of a cohesive system working. Right, it, you know, like it's like teamwork is available. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like when your when your car is working properly, you're not thinking about oh, all the parts in the engine and what's this part doing, what that what, what that part is doing. It's only when something goes wrong, which in with humans is trauma, uh, that 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 occurs. So 
I mean, I love the like the soul retrieval stuff. I love because it it it's it. You can almost look at it the same way where when when the soul was retrieved, it's it's becoming more integrated mm -hmm. to where it's not so overt anymore. But it, but from the IFS perspective, the parts are always there. They are full on sub personalities. You know, they're not just emotions. Even though we will phrase it that way occasionally, I have an angry part. I have a sad part. But they really are sub personalities that see the world differently. Mm -hmm. from each other and have different moods and it, it's just so fascinating once once you dig into that and experience that for yourself i think once people actually experience it, it it's it becomes very hard to deny uh mm -hmm. that they're there and that they're actually full on like you know little little parts of us so to speak right and uh, one of the ways i describe that experiencing of the part um is hijacking when the the trauma response is still there from the part you know it's still acting from a wounded place. Um, one of the things you and I chatted about before this conversation was the idea of all parts being valid. And that really kind of flows into this piece of the conversation, because what you're talking about, how we can pathologize or minimize certain parts because they're not doing what we think they should be doing, or however we're judging that situation, recognizing that even if a part is creating difficulties in your life, right? Because, and we'll get more into that, but even if it's creating difficulties, it's still a valid part. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, we have all kinds of thoughts about that in IFS, uh, as I imagine you do too, uh, from your experience. So, so, so we, when we look at parts in IFS, there, there's two categories of them. I mean, there's more, but at, at a high level, there, there are ones that are trying to protect the system. And then there are ones who are carrying toxic self-beliefs and toxic emotions from, from trauma. The, what we normally see on the surface in terms of symptoms is the protectors what, that we call them, where they are doing certain things in a very intentional way. Again, not random, not genetic, uh, to try and prevent further pain from, from being taken on by the, by the exiles, which are the ones who are carrying uh, the pain. So this can range from addictive behaviors to uh, anger issues like like high reactivity or, or impulse control like it, it's a whole there's a whole litany basically anything in the DSM as far as IFS is concerned and more uh, you can ascribe to and we see we see it over and over again it's it's protectors doing it intentionally with very good intentions now sometimes the results are not so good certainly with addictions we see that, that you know that, that it's obvious how that it, how that can kind of go wrong but when the parts take on these roles during when we're children, uh, a lot of times that is the best, like it's, it's the best idea they can come up with to try and help uh, it maintain to the degree possible the attachment with parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so people pleasing, for example, will come along during that time because the more we please our parents, uh, the better the attachment is. But what we're doing is we're sacrificing our own authenticity mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. And then that that's okay as a kid, you know, when you when you have to do it to survive. But then when we become adults, these things outlive their usefulness. So the intent of protectors is always, always positive, even suicidal parts, which seems like how could that be positive? They're just trying to have a way out of the pain mm -hmm. when, they, when there's no other option as they see it. Right. So even that is a self-sacrifice, even that has a has a good intention, as crazy as that may sound. Uh, it first, so that that's that's what we find. So they're all doing their best, and a big part of IFS is finding out what their story is, how they came on to take these roles, and then what they need to shift. Because they, what we find is they don't like doing these jobs any more than the person likes being an alcoholic or whatever the symptoms are. Like these parts are exhausted. Yep. Uh, they they a lot of times they see the the, the collateral damage but they just don't know what else to do because they're kids, they're inner children. Mm -hmm. So when we, the more we see that, you know, as, as each person goes inside, then we, we learn pretty quickly. And again, that helps with the self-compassion that, oh yeah, this behavior, which is so awful for me every day and has isolated me and caused all these problems, there's actually a good intention behind it. And we just need to learn what that is and, and figure out what that part needs to, to not do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's really brilliantly said. And I just want to clarify one point in what you were talking about, which is that when you said they can't see a better way out of it because they're children, I just want to clarify that what you're saying is that that part 
is frozen in the developmental stage or stuck in a developmental stage where it doesn't have any more problem solutions or problem solving skills, right? It's not matured the way the rest of you or different parts have. And uh, one more caveat is the whole suicidal approach. That is super dicey in mental health and behavioral health. We always want safety planning and to try and commandeer that part to knock it off. And frequently when we're in that process, of course, we want to make sure people are safe, right? But frequently we're in that, when we're in that process, we really end up devaluing and humiliating that part that is already feeling suicidal. And so safety planning can actually be counterintuitive sometimes with the IFS thinking. You'll have to make your own decisions as a clinician about that, right? But I just want to say that even that suicidal part is valid. And their plan would work to get you out of pain. So stepping back into honoring those parts, having compassion and understanding that they're functioning on purpose. I really like the way you said that that it's purposeful. One of the most common experiences I hear in my practice with this uh, protector type part taking over is people will say things to me like all of a sudden or out of the blue, or I went zero to 60 and nothing flat, usually into anger. That's a real fast response. Um, that's not the only response. It's just what I typically see in mine. And so that that overcome feeling where you feel like you are not able to control yourself or you realize your response is disproportionate to what just happened. Do you feel safe in saying that's typically a protector part? Rushing to our rescue, actually. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times it can be exiles too. Exiles can come on with intense sadness, anxiety, uh, but usually anger is a protect, you know, it's a boundary setting mechanism so mm -hmm. it, but it's always a part when the parts take over we call that blending and ifs when they basically we think we're the part so it's i am angry right and then after an episode of rage you know 10 minutes or an hour later or whatever it is we look back and we say what what just happened mm -hmm. why did i react that strongly then we're not blended with the part anymore now mm -hmm. we're back either another part is blended or we're with self which we will get into in a, in a few minutes but when that part is blended, yeah, it takes over and it, and it, we're almost out of control sometimes, depending on what the emotion is. And it, and it can be scary when you look back and think about, wow, how did that happen? You know, just this, it's this rush of energy that, you know, we're just overtaken by. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I say to a lot of people in my practice is if you're not doing something on purpose, like cognitively, then it's possible you're being hijacked by a part you know, or blended, a blended part of you is coming out. I'm wondering what other parts should we be looking for? We've talked about protectors and um, please feel free to define that a little bit more and what their behavior might look like. Um, let's talk sure. about that. Let's break it down. What do the parts look like and what are their function? Yeah. Yeah. So on one hand, everyone's different depending on their, our, our trauma history. Uh, but there are, so there are two types of protectors. So we, we kind of can break it down a little more. There are managers, which are proactive. So they're kind of the day-to-day -day keeping things under control. Uh, some of those behaviors may be anxiety because they're always looking for threats so that they can plan ahead. Yes. Uh, a, a persistent fear of what might go wrong in any situation is, is going to be a manager because they're always on the lookout for what could go wrong. And you, you know, you can easily see how that's that, that comes in childhood, depending on a person's history, like always having to be on alert uh, for what can go wrong. Uh, but we also see like not all these things are, are pathological necessarily. Like there, there can be managers that when we go to work, they, they get, in, get us in the zone to do whatever our job is, right? We're, we're in flow, so to speak. So I don't want to make it sound like it, you know, not all parts are behaving suboptimally at all times. Like they, they really are a natural part of us and they're meant to be there. Uh, the other category of protectors are, is called firefighters. So those are the reactive ones. So those, so whereas managers are trying to prevent us from being triggered, firefighters are reacting after we've been triggered. And their name comes from they're just bringing in the fire hose and they're whatever they need to do. If they have to destroy the house to put out the fire, that's what they do. So these are your addictions, uh, suicidal ideation, 
all these things that kind of come along after an emotion or a trigger uh, is present. And their job is to just try to put it out at all costs. And then the managers can take over uh, again after that. So those are the two protectors. Uh, and then the exiles, the ones that typically they're younger. And thank you for clarifying that earlier, that these parts do get stuck in the past when they're traumatized. That's a very, very important point. Mm -hmm. So the exiles are typically younger. They're holding pain. And it's really them. Those are what the protectors are protecting from getting hurt more. And so the exiles, their name comes from typically they're, they're kind of locked away in there. And the job of the protectors at any means necessary is to, is to prevent them from coming up because they're afraid that the system will get overwhelmed. And, and, and then strong firefighters will come in like, like, you know, whatever the case may be. So the, the focus of the protectors is keeping those parts locked up out of conscious awareness. Uh, but life has a way of making that happen, right? So when these intense, you know, sadness or anxiety, uh, and it can also be anger or fear that exiles are carrying when they do come up, when they're triggered by life, that's when the firefighters come in to eliminate that as quickly as possible. What an elegant system. Right? I mean, yeah. really, it, it ensures survival as well as social integration as best as possible because we have different parts from which we can function. And um, sometimes when I'm describing this super simply to my patients, it's like managers kind of take care of a lot of the internal stressors that we have, like the hypervigilance and making sure things don't go wrong, just like you're saying, like keep us in the shoot of what we want to experience. Whereas the firefighters will come out and they, for lack of a better word in this moment, indiscriminately put out the fire. And so that's where the collateral damage comes from because, you know, um, 15 minutes after a rage, all of a sudden you're wondering why everybody can't get over it the way you just did, right? And because we have different systems working in each individual. So I would love to hear just a teensy bit more about the exiles and why they are suppressed. And in IFS, how do you locate them? Like what's the process of even starting to find these parts? Right, yeah, so they, they take on again, the pain and the toxic self-beliefs that are instilled in us when we're traumatized. Mm -hmm. And so then the protectors come online or, uh, you know, they, they take on the roles to, to protect these little ones from more of that. Right. So they're, so we, we don't, again, we're normally day to day. It's more, we're more protector oriented, you know, unless we're triggered. So if something is, is specifically triggering you at a time, then you can bet there's, there's an exile uh, involved. But so the, we in IFS, it's very important to honor the hierarchy. And what I mean by that is the, the protectors are in charge in there. So we, we don't go directly to exiles without protector permission. Hmm. Uh, because when, and Dick Schwartz would tell you when he did that, because he didn't know when he was creating this, there, there was hell to pay on the back end because hmm. the protectors do not like that. Uh, and th there will be consequences. So we start with protectors and we get to know them. We find out about their roles, their history. What they want us to, anything else they want us to know uh, about themselves. And then eventually we ask, who are you protecting mm -hmm. in there? And they will show you when, when they trust you enough and they trust the you know, practitioner that you're working with. Uh, and, and so the, this, the exile can first present, it's either a visual of your little self sitting in a room, for example, like your old bedroom is common, yeah. uh, or it can just be a memory that comes up, or sometimes it's just an emotion it comes up. Sometimes these things are pre-verbal. They're that young. And so there's not a, you know, they don't talk. They, it's just really emotional and like a felt sense yes. uh, of what they are. So, so much of IFS is about being open to however a part presents itself because it's always different. Uh, even for a given person, every part, you know, can show up uh, a little differently. And, and then, and then with the exiles, it's similar in terms of establishing trust with it. And then it'll, and then inviting it to share its story, what it went through, what it's what what it's feeling, uh, and there's some other steps that you know we may or may not get into, but that that's the initial like getting to know you phase, which is so so important to establish that attachment within yourself mm -hmm. that, that the part you know to some degree missed out on uh, as a kid. Yeah, and so there's a pair a part that is reparenting along with the unblending that's happening here. 
So I'm I'm aware that we've been talking for a good amount of time, and I, I just want to say one thing, and then I think I'm going to ask you for final thoughts about this, and then we'll do part two. Sure. All right. So um, <clears throat> I just wanted to reemphasize what you mean by felt sense, because I know that we know what that is, but a lot of people don't, except they do, because you've all had it before. Miss, uh, you know, whoever you are in, your, in this audience, you have had a felt sense. It's the somatic experience that you have usually coupled with an emotion, but not always, because a felt sense could also be flatness or numbness. Right. And so what you're talking about when you say felt sense is not only to be aware of the emotional word like sadness, but maybe there's heaviness in your chest that goes with that sadness. So I just wanted to redescribe what felt sense was. Yeah, beautiful. I would love to hear any kind of summary thoughts you have about these different parts. And um, it can be anything, of course. And then when we move into the next section, we're going to start talking about what is self and what does the process of healing look like with IFS? So Perfect. Any, yeah, any closing thoughts for this time? Yeah, I, th I think just what you noted earlier really touched me in terms of the intelligence of this system, right? And, it, and the more you dig into it, the more that's what we find, like there's an order and it just makes sense. And that's what's so powerful about this. Like it, it's it's simple, but it, you know it's intricate. But it's there's a simplicity and an intelligence there that just struck me right off the bat. Uh, when I, and it sounds like you too, when we first started learning about this, and it, it that's part of what makes it so powerful. Mm -hmm. It sure does. 